the uh, the evening uh, lecture is actually uh, a culmination of a bunch of different lectures that we as chiropractors had to take in for our continuing education. So some of it's you know pretty advanced stuff, but you guys have all been through the basics and you guys can handle it. Um, some of these things they'll they'll probably be better understood if you refer back to one of the previous you know other other presentations and i think some of the some of the things that we're going to go over here this is such a long presentation it, it was like multiple continuing ed seminars that i just took the things that i was really interested in and put them together to share with you guys so what we're talking about is the uh the different causes of subluxation for example we always boil it down to stress or imbalance you know of stresses but it's it's not just like a physical stress like i got hit by a truck or i got in a car accident or fell or did a heavy lift it's physical stress it's mental stresses and it's chemical stresses okay so we're uh we're going to kind of go into um everybody understands how physical stress can cause a subluxation right my my body has a certain strength and resistance and if I get in an accident and the force of that accident is more than like the resistive force that I can put forth, then there's an imbalance there. Okay. If my, if I get in an accident and my resistive force, like my muscles can, can handle that stress and counter it to the exact degree, then I don't get injured. Okay. I've protected myself. But what happens a lot of times is it's more stress. It's more physical trauma than what my body can absorb and there's that imbalance of force where there's more on this side and not enough on this side to meet it sorry and then that imbalance of force is what causes that subluxation now that's that's an outside force coming in overpowering my inside force the opposite of that also turns out happens okay and the best example that i can think of is if we're carrying something down the steps you got your your laundry basket in front of you and you step for that last step, you know, and it's not there. Okay. You put out a force in that case, you put out a force to meet something and it wasn't there. In that case, the imbalance of force is still there. It's, it's just that my expectation for something being there, I put out a force to meet something and it wasn't there. And that imbalance can cause a subluxation and that all makes sense. Okay. But I think what, what doesn't make sense to people is how do mental stresses cause a subluxation or how do chemical stresses cause a subluxation? Okay. So we're going to go over that. <clears throat> um, this study was actually done on sled dogs. Okay. And they took the, uh, the sled dog community and they uh, asked for volunteers. They got these, these sled dogs actually to undergo chiropractic analysis and then chiropractic treatment. And what they found was this culture within the sled dog community is uh, based on, of course, the alpha and then all the, the subordinates. So when the alpha is getting them all trained in to pull that, that uh, sled, the alpha dog will pummel the other dogs into submission if they step out of line. Okay. And he'll, he'll make them submit by taking a posture of submission. And incidentally, it's rounding out those curves. So you guys know about like the normal curves in us. Dogs have those same curves minus one. Okay. But you can see that that dog up there has that nice, smooth curve here okay that would be the equivalent of like our cervical curve and then there's a, a curve this way and then the sacrum okay this dog you can see he actually rounds that curve and rounds under the tail under the sacrum so straightening out those curves all right we have a similar posture when we're under stress it's called the stress response but your body does that without us even thinking about it and that's what they found with the sled dogs is they'll get pummeled okay maybe physically but maybe just intimidated all right 
and it's those ones that were intimidated and not physically pummeled that we're interested in for our purposes. Because we can understand the physically pummeled dog getting a subluxation. But what didn't make sense was that they did that analysis like we would do on, on our uh, first day, we would do that analysis and we would see a certain pattern that was associated with the subluxations that that person has, okay? And what they found was those dogs who had been intimidated into submission, they changed their posture, all right? And that posture was then associated with um, nerve pressure and dysfunction, okay? We don't know about pain, but it was tender when they went and palpated the dog, and it was also associated with if those nerves went to the stomach, that dog had a, you know, a sour stomach or an upset stomach. If it went to the lungs, that dog had, you know, more mucus in their lungs or whatever it was. It was an uh, actual physical manifestation of uh, dysfunction there because of that subluxation. And it came from a mental stress, okay? What they found was they could take the dog out of that situation, they can adjust those subluxations, and they can change that posture back to this, back to the normal posture. They can correct that physical subluxation. But as soon as they exposed that dog to the alpha, even from across the room, not letting them touch each other, just the sight of that dog, this guy went back into that posture, okay? And he went back into that same neurological pattern. And he started exhibiting the same symptoms, all right? And all of this like clicked into view for me. Everything kind of clicked into place because um, you remember Val way back when. So we had a, a gal who worked the, the front desk for us and she did marketing for us. And um, she was in a bad car accident on 94 one night after work. And she got, she got a flat tire and she pulled over and she got rear-ended by a SUV going like 70. And it almost killed her. And um, it took us three months to get her, like, she was a mess. Just physically, the, the physical subluxations that were there, um, we got to it before it healed. So that was great. But remember, one generation of cell turnover is between three and four months. So it took that long of us working on those patterns and those subluxations to get that turnover and that next generation of cells to come back in in a healthy position and in, in a healthy state, okay? So we got her out of that pattern. We got everything healed back in a good position, and she hadn't driven down to the city since, okay? And when she finally did, as soon as she drove by that place in the road, she immediately said, I'm seeing this show up. Um, people are just getting emotionally overwhelmed and they're having these emotional, this is a physical health. So that's kind of why I started doing that above the Atlas. See above the Atlas. Yeah. So I started doing that because I can only do so much for somebody in a physical sense. Okay. And they have to be able to take some, some tools and some information and knowing that this is going on, address those issues that happen above the atlas, right? We can, we can change that pattern. We can, we can help fix that subluxation, but until they kind of balance that trauma, which is why I talk about that, that balance, the, the way to, to balance out that positive and negative in our mind, right? Until we do that, we're always going to kind of be recycling that trauma in our body. In that respect, these guys really suggested that subluxation less of like a physical thing and more of like an emotional thing, almost like a memory that your body has of a trauma, whether it was physical or mental, or in some cases, even chemical. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain the chemical probably at a different point, but I really wanted to hit on this um, because when, like I said, I started paying attention to this. I'm, I'm asking people about it. And a gal that I take care of, she said, yeah, you know, now that you said that, that makes sense because I remember getting a call at like three in the morning. It was, it was really late at night. I remember waking up to a phone call knowing that it was bad because nobody calls at 3 a.m. And on the phone with my mom and my mom said that 
my dad had just been killed in an accident, you know. And it, she said, I remember hearing a crack, like, in my neck. Like, I just, like, went into shock. I just almost, like, she, she described it almost like having a seizure, just having the, just that contraction and hearing a crack in her neck. And all of a sudden, she said, I st started getting just burning down my arms into my hands and fingers. It wasn't a physical thing, right? It was that emotional stress. So much like we have the uh, mechanism of imbalance where we put out a force because we perceive that there's going to be something to meet it, we put out that force because we perceive or the body perceives, our mind actually perceives that there's a stress coming in, an invasive force, okay? Your body only has one response to that invasive stress. It's contraction, all right? So when we perceive that that stress is coming in, the body's response is contraction. So you think about like, the muscles of your neck, for example, contracting. When she described that as a seizure, like almost like seizing, I see people that have epilepsy and have different seizure disorders, and they will like seize with such violence, with such force, they'll actually fracture vertebrae. We'll see compression fractures in their spine from a seizure. So the body is perfectly capable of generating that kind of force, all right? So with that in mind, now we've got this perception that there's an invasive force. And we put forth, or the body puts forth, enough, what it perceives to be enough, hopefully, to, to balance that out so that we're not injured. But it's not a physical force. But the body puts out that physical force to meet it, and that imbalance of force, it can, it definitely causes subluxation, but it can actually, like I said, cause compression fracture. It can fracture vertebrae. Um, so that's the, <laughs> The, the emotional side. That was the sled dog study, okay? Um, a similar mechanism actually happens, and it was studied in diabetics. It happens with chemical and poison, okay? So we studied it with sugar, but an easier example would be ammonia. You guys have all, like, caught a whiff of a real strong chemical ammonia smell, okay? I was in powerlifting and we would always like snap an ammonia cap and like hold it under each other's nose and, and you would have just a, a vicious like physical reaction, just like a, a whiplash when that ammonia hits you in the face. It's a chemical, all right? Again, it's an invasive force. It's that chemical invading your body. Your body does pick that up. It senses that there's an invasive force. And what's the, the response again? The body has one response to that stress. It's contraction. And all those cells contract, not just um, muscle cells. Actually, even like uh, the cells of your pancreas contract to expel the uh, <laughs> insulin. That's the word I'm looking for. So um, you think about the ammonia, okay, that invasive force, that chemical coming in, the body contracting to, to meet that force. Now think about sugar, all right? Anything above and beyond what your body can deal with, your body even, even metabolically sees it as a poison. So in, in the case of sugar, let's say I just down like a, a six pack of Mountain Dew and there's like 60 grams of sugar per can. That's way more sugar than what my body is going to physically be able to use or probably even process, okay? So it sees that sugar, the pancreas sees that much sugar as a poison or an invasive force chemically. It's like that ammonia coming up your nose. And what does the pancreas do? It's not just the pancreas. We're introducing a new term tonight called a vert mirror. Okay? Vert mirror is the vertebrae plus all the nerves and all the tissues controlled by those nerves. So if we've got in here where those nerves go out to the pancreas, we've got those, those, you know, probably three vertebrae where there's a, a, a pancreatic complex, it's called, of nerves that go out to the pancreas. 
But at the same time, those, those functional nerves from those branches go out to the pancreas, but the motor nerves from those same branches go out to the muscles surrounding that area, okay? Those are the ones that are going to contract at, at, the, at the surface, okay? The pancreas contracts and, and expels as much insulin as it can, but it's almost like a defensive mechanism. Again, they're looking at, at this as almost a defensive mechanism of your body to shut down the nerve uh, energy or, or, or innervation to that pancreas because if it didn't do that, if that mechanism, that reflex, it's actually a reflex mechanism that contracts and actually causes a subluxation at that level to, to shut down the pancreas to a degree, okay? Because if the pancreas just kept running like that, it would literally burn out. Like it would probably kill us or it would kill the pancreas. So pancreatic failure, something of that nature. So they're thinking now of that actual physical subluxation from the contraction as a defense mechanism, kind of like throwing, having a breaker box in your house, right? And instead of the toaster blowing up and starting a fire and burning down the house, the breaker switch flips and it just shuts down power to the toaster, okay? When the kid's got the, you know, fork in the toaster or whatever's happening there. So again, it's just a new way of thinking about things. We know a physical stress can cause subluxation. We know now that there are, are very few, but there are mechanisms for subluxation, a physical manifestation in your body of an actual emotional event, an emotional trauma. Okay. And we all deal with those. So that's why I designed that above the atlas. But what I've got to do is in, in future um, talks here, go into that chemical and, and just different chemicals of the body because we see certain patterns within the body that, that are associated with that stress response, okay? Like the, the elevated cortisol levels, the elevated, um, there, there are certain uh, chemicals within the body that actually elevate blood pressure, elevate blood sugar, all those things too. And when you look at the symptoms of that stress response, it's things like all, all the same symptoms of heart disease and diabetes and, and all, all the top killers, basically. So these are things that actually can probably be avoided and remedied with just a little bit of knowledge on the subject, okay? And there are things that we can do chemically to help those, but there are also things that we can do chiropractically and even emotionally to help with those, those chemical uh, subluxations there. So that was probably the most interesting part of the presentation, okay? But I just uh, wanted to share some of these with you guys on a lighter note and just uh, kind of pound home the point that your body's innate intelligence we talk about that program that, that, you know, here's how your body's supposed to operate. When you throw that body, that, that innate intelligence, that ability to adapt, you throw it a scenario to adapt to, it always adapts, okay? When, when you stop adapting, in chiropractic, we say the, the one cause of death is failure to adapt. Like, I could get hit by a train as long as my body is still able to adapt to that, I'm going to live, Right? When, when I die, it's because failed, my body failed to adapt to that, that stress or that trauma. So a tree, being a living thing, has an innate intelligence. It has a program written for how that tree is supposed to operate. And when we throw something like this, where, okay, the trees above me are cutting off my, my food source and my energy source to the sun, what does innate intelligence do? It, it, finds a way around it, okay? Something like that. Put a curve in there, all right? Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense, right? That's what we call just uh, an adaptation, okay? Or a compensation. Same thing, okay? We put something in there, in the way of that tree, and it just grew around it, all right? That's another example of that innate intelligence, all right? We can understand that. That makes perfect sense. And it's acceptable. It's, it's like awesome to us to see it. It's like, wow, but it's perfectly acceptable, right? We wouldn't say, uh, 
for, for um, the purpose, cosmetic purposes, we're going to cut half of that tree out because it's going to kill the tree, right? Or at least it's going to decrease the function of that tree, probably shorten the lifespan of that tree if I remove that motorcycle. Would you agree? Going back to that, that last one, it would probably shorten the lifespan of that tree to straighten that tree. Okay? Those are acceptable to us. Those, for some reason, aren't acceptable to us. Okay? I, I like to pound home the point that a subluxation isn't just a mouth, you know, misalignment. Sorry, just, it's not just a misalignment. Just because we have a curve in that spine doesn't mean there's a subluxation. It's only a subluxation if it's actually interfering with the function. If it's interfering with that message being sent from the brain out to the body, and then the bo it makes the body less adaptive, then it's a problem, okay? But just because we have a curve there doesn't necessarily mean there's a, a subluxation. That might just be the body's adaptation or, or compensation, okay? So I had to start thinking differently, all right? Because a lot of times I would see something like that and I would say, I'm going to straighten that. And a lot of times, <laughs> straightening that would make the person worse, okay? So we had to get down to the nitty-gritty individual level and start looking at individual levels there, not just pattern. You know, pattern work is fun to do because we find things like that sled dog study. But on an individual level, that's where the Gonstead system is different. We don't just look at patterns. We look at individual levels and say, okay, here, right? This vertebrae is level. That one is tipped up. Is there pressure there? If there's pressure there, okay, then this is what we'd call a compensation. And if we can correct that pressure, it'll compensate back, and the body corrects itself. Our focus isn't to straighten that curve. Our focus is to find that subluxation, that nerve pressure, and remove that. So it was kind of a, every once in a while, we just need a, a kick in the pants, a wake-up call to say, hey, maybe you're not looking at something right, okay? I just had that with you today. So it helps me to have those little kick in the pants, wake-up calls and, and say, okay, we need to start looking closer, not just, you know, step back and give it the 30,000-foot uh, view because the medical community looks at it as a cosmetic issue. And because somebody has a curve in their spine, and you can see how she's actually got a short leg on this side, and that hip is even lower on this side, okay? She was just born with a short leg. That happens anatomically sometimes. We're born with a short leg. And this is compens compensation, okay? It's a compensatory curve. And a lot of times, you give that person just a, a small wedge, and boop, that hip comes right back up to level, and everything straightens out. And then sometimes we have <laughs> an issue where something like that is caused by malposition in the hips, which we know somebody who that happened to. And, and again, when we correct that, everything kind of straightens out, you know, but our focus wasn't to straighten that spine. Our focus was to find that individual subluxation. But this is the medical answer to that. It's the Harrington rods. Well, we'll just straighten it for cosmetic reasons. For cosmetic reasons, with that's, that's cosmetically better, okay? That, that scar from here to here is cosmetically better than, I mean, the kid still has curve there. You can see that one shoulder is higher, okay? So, again, I'm not harping on the medical community because they saved my life. My appendix ruptured. I would have been toast if I hadn't gone into the hospital. I was mauled by a bull when I was 17. I would have been toast if I hadn't had that. But, uh, you know, we just, I'd want you guys to start thinking about things a little differently because I got this information and all of a sudden I had to digest it. It took me a little bit to say, okay, maybe I'm looking at things, maybe I'm not looking at things wrong. Maybe I could just look at things better. You know, I think that's what it really comes down to. Um, you know, every time that a new theory in quantum physics comes along, 
it's usually it's not replacing an old theory saying, well, that theory is wrong. It's just an expansion on that old theory that says this is just a little bit more accurate. We, we still don't know everything. We still don't understand everything about the body, right? But every day we're learning a little bit more, getting a little bit more accurate. If we're paying attention, which is what you guys got to hold me to, make me do my work, right? Make me pay attention because that's what makes me a better chiropractor. So many chiropractors get sloppier and less specific the longer they're in practice. I actually heard one of the presenters actually say that. He said, the longer I'm in practice, the more I find that I'm less specific. And I thought, man, you know what we should be saying? The longer I'm in practice, the better I get and the more specific. The, the, the less force I can use to move a bone, okay? I, if I had everything lined up just perfectly and I had that subluxation figured out in all three dimensions, I should be able to adjust that subluxation. And I'm, I'm putting this out there, guys. I should be able to adjust that subluxation with about the amount of force that you could stand on your eyeball. Okay. And, and if I had everything just perfect, I wouldn't have to be a big, strong guy and lift weights and crush it. <laughs> I would be able to, to sneak that sucker in there with, with skill and speed and finesse, and your body would accept that force perfectly because it was delivered perfectly. So that's, that's my goal. Um, again, you guys are here tonight. You guys I love and respect. So you guys are going to hold me accountable to getting better and adjusting lighter every year rather than harder and less specific. Okay. Again, uh, this presentation is much longer than this. And we've got other studies and, and cases and stuff that, that we're going to, we're going to go over. But I just want to leave you with, okay. This is a, a fine example of um, the specificity, the body correcting itself. Because Jacob came in, he's 40 now, but he had uh, what was diagnosed as, you know, a scoliosis, a curvature of the spine. Anything where we have a plumb line there and the body deviates from that straight up and down line medically is called a, a, a scoliosis, okay? So these are kind of, these are kind of crappy. Sorry. I, I just like took it with my phone and put it into the presentation, but you can see the plumb line here. And then you can see how far off plumb his spine was. Um, I adjusted two things on this guy. I mean, we just adjusted those two things until the body corrected itself. And it was a hip and it was an L5. So those two things we just, kept on removing, you know, slowly but surely, whittling down that pressure until there was no pressure there, and then, whoop, the body corrected itself. We didn't go up here and pound this part of the curve in and that part of the curve in this way. We just looked for specifically where that pressure was that was causing his body to have to compensate, and when we remove it, the body will compensate back, okay? Now, sometimes I get what I thought was a compensation ended up actually being a subluxation. So we have to adjust to those. But 80% of the time, when you find that subluxation, your body's going to correct that compensation by itself. Okay. So we're wrapping it up. Uh, I do want to do, um, because I think it's really important, because we're all going through some emotional stress right now. And I do want to do that. Uh, above the atlas again next week. And then I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the chemical uh, subluxation and the stress response and kind of educate people on the different um, disease processes that we'll see with that stress response and how to, how to adjust those things. Because we can fight that, that chemical stress. We can, we can help balance that with diet. We can help balance that with supplementation. We can help balance it with chiropractic. So it, it just takes a little bit more. Okay. So thanks again for the showing up tonight, you guys, and I'll cut you loose. And if you have any questions, you can ask now and we can cut everybody loose online. And thanks again. Um, if, if you didn't know, just for watching, just for showing up again, if you haven't been checked for subluxation before, we do that at no charge. You get two free adjustments just for showing up or watching us online. So just give us a call. Okay. Thank you.